Eminent Turkish scholar says the BRICS nations play a powerful role in global growth and poverty eradication, among others. China is the second largest economy in the world. In, in, in that regard, also China is very important and key player for world production and world manufacturing as a center. And also China is a, sitting in the center of the global supply chains. Uh, in that regard, uh, China and other countries are playing very important uh, roles for uh, global growth, uh, poverty eradication, and also uh, general uh, global development. Kolakolu speaks highly of the BRICS Plus cooperation model, which is a platform for emerging markets and developing countries and is built for cooperation and development. Kolakolu thinks that it will help humankind handle crises and disasters with coordinated efforts. This is not only for uh, military and political confrontations, but also for solving the issues like pandemic, for example. The BRICS countries represent around 42% of the world population and one-fifth of the global GDP. Thank you so much, Master Control. Mrs. Yerim, of course, a pleasant good evening and welcome. It's always a pleasure having you. Now, yes, good evening, Matt. Good evening and uh, to all viewers and listeners. Thank you. Now, what is the purpose of the BRICS economies and, and how is that going to affect us as a developing nation? Well, the, the BRICS uh, have not really fulfilled all the actions as yet, but there, there's a, a huge potential force and opposition to the Western countries. What has happened recently is that events are moving in their favor. The initial BRICS country, and, and there's still five at the moment, that is Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, and, um, uh, and uh, so there are five, and South Africa, right? So there are five of them now, but about 13 other countries have applied to join BRICS, including Iran, including Saudi Arabia. Now, the very fact that countries want to join BRICS, even Turkey itself, which is uh, considered sort of a, a, a part of the European nation, um, they also want to join, and there's talk that even Germany wants to join as well under, under the BRICS banner. So what is, this is telling us is that the U United States and the Western hegemony over global trade and global influence is being attacked, is being broken, and that's going to have significant ramifications for the rest of the world. There's no question the trend has started moving away from United States, and you're seeing it with regards to United States dollars as a medium of trade for the international market. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I think the most, most recent uh, development in favor of the BRICS is that Saudi Arabia and China has agreed to, to, to trade in Chinese yuan. In other words, normally, if China has to buy oil from Saudi Arabia, they first have to go and buy United States dollars and pay for the oil in United States dollars. With the present agreement, they just have to pay in their currency. It would mean to say demand for U.S. dollars is going to decline. Similarly, India has um, engaged about 12 countries yeah. that, that will accept rupees with regards to their trade. So here again, normally country A will have to buy U.S. dollars and buy, purchase from India. And if India has to buy any goods and services from that country, they also have to buy U.S. dollars. So the demand for U.S. dollars is going to decline considerably. Um, ultimately, at the moment, there's so much uncertainty in the world that people are still flocking for the United States dollars as a medium of savings and as a, as a medium of uh, trade. But that trend is, is moving away very swiftly from United States dollars. And we have to ask the question, if that trend continue, and there's good evidence that it will, what will be the implication for us in Trinidad with regards to our investment in United States dollars and, and our demand for United States dollars? And those are things that we, we ought to be very concerned, or at least at this stage, be discussing it in a very meaningful way. And, and I agree with you, because when you look at the 
as you said, the, co the countries that make up BRICS is Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And you are, I mean, if Germany steps in there, that's a big player. We're also hearing talk that Mexico could be considering being a part of the BRIC, um, uh, the BRIC nations. Now, that's when, true. when you look at it, the, that China and India will, by 2050, be the world's dominant suppliers of manufactured goods. Now, while Brazil and Russia will become dominant as, as suppliers of raw materials, I, I mean, and they're not going to just sit by and, uh, you know, idly wait for people to play catch up with them. We're talking about a shift, not just in the global economy, but also in the whole geopolitical aspect of it. Uh, they'll be able to circumvent the U.S. This is something that they can put in place so they won't have to be fearful of embargoes or sanctions, as the case may be. So again, as Trinidad and Tobago, a small player, I guess, on, on the whole global market, should we be discussing it and what should we be discussing if it is that we're looking at this narrative? Well, we need to discuss it for the simple reason. This is a global trend. And we need to find out what exactly would be the implication on us as a small nation. Now, what, what, what we're seeing at the moment is a, hardening, is a hardening of stances between the Western powers and, and this new block that is taking place. And we are seeing it played out in Ukraine. We are seeing it very clearly in Ukraine, where the Western nations have taken a stand and actually looking at Ukraine, using Ukraine as a theater for war against Russia. In the meantime, Russia has been able to survive all the embargoes, despite the freezing of their, of, of their, their bank accounts and so on, which is probably billions of dollars of their assets have been frozen by the West. So what that tells other countries that if you oppose America, you run the risk of all your assets being frozen, your external assets. And that has people, persons, countries very, very uh, skeptical. They're very nervous about it. So they're saying, can we get an, an alternative? Another example is that you use the SWIFT system for international trade. So Russia and China, they're trying to bypass that now and create their own system for international trade. In addition to that, they say, look, we cannot rely on IMF and we have to create an uh, alternate institution that could actually give funding to the member countries if and when required. So they've, they've already started their, in their um, national development plan. But let me ask you something, Mr. Sierra. I mean, this whole BRICS economy, there's going to be some backing. There's going to be some asset backing to what's taking place with the trade and, and as far as the money goes. Now, we know the U.S. prints money. That's, that's a, not a problem. They print it. And also, oil prices are pegged to the U.S. dollar. Now, should Trinidad and Tobago be looking at some of these assets and perhaps looking to steer in that direction, if not at least putting everything in one basket, but at least having a more diversified global economic portfolio? Well, they should, but they're in a quandary because there's a, there, there's a lot of anomalies in the international market because Japan, Korea, Vietnam, China, Russia, they've all, they've all been dumping U.S. treasuries. I think in one month between China and Japan, they dumped over 400 million U.S. treasuries. In other words, they sell it out in the market. So that is of extreme concern to America because if, if supply of U.S. dollars, U.S. investment um, becomes so, so prevalent, it's going to drop the value of the U.S. dollars, and that's what they are worried about. But the major purchasers of those treasuries could be very well the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So they could just be buying it up and sapping it out from the market because there's, if there's an oversupply of U.S. dollars. But what China, Russia and many countries have been doing is stocking up on gold over the years. China is the largest producer of gold in the world today. South Africa is about the fifth or sixth uh, uh, producer of gold, but they still represent a very important um, uh, partner in the BRICS countries, South Africa. So, you know, so there's been a realignment of things, and now even Argentina wants to join, as you said, Mexico, you have Iran, you have... You have Saudi Arabia. Mikey, I don't know if you saw recently that China was able to bring two sworn enemies, Saudi Arabia and, uh, and, uh, and um, 
Iran together no. at the table and, and talking peace. That's a major, major event in the world today. Yeah, but Mr. let me ask you, and I'm sure many of our listeners are, are thinking the same thing. America is not just going to sit idly by. The West is not going to sit idly by and say, listen, um, we're not going to see our economy just devalue. We're not going to see that this BRICS is going to be the alternative to what we have set up globally. And we can expect something. I mean, something as far as... Yes, uh, I mean, no, that, that battle, currency wars have been fought for years. Why, when... Uh, when uh, Saddam Hussein said he's going to accept the euro currency for oil in, in 2000, 2001, that was a major reason for the invasion of Iraq. When Libya said they're going to move out of the US dollars for trading in oil, he was taken off the face of the earth. So uh, are those coincidents? So, that war has been taking place for a long while, currency wars. Why do you think uh, America is, is so annoyed with, with Venezuela? Because Chavez said that he's going, going to trade in other currencies besides U.S. dollars. So this is precisely, this war has been going on for years and, and, and it has been fought in a clandestine way with regards to the purpose, but in a very open way, military way, for everyone to see under different, under different reasons. For example, weapons of mass destruction, destruction and so on. But all of that, uh, the, 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 the world has been fooled in believing all of that, but it's really a currency war. But what's going to war. Let me ask you, Mr. Yeah, what about our heritage and stabilization fund? I mean, what's going to happen? I mean, we, are we just going to well, wake up one morning and say, listen, there's nothing there, there's no value there because we simply did not have this discussion and we were totally unprepared? That is true. So when... When the market is in turmoil, as you see in the stock market, is that you, you take out your, your, your money in the stock, from the stock market, you take out your money from bonds and you leave it in money market. That means it's a short term. So the other challenge that we'll have, in what currency do we hold it? In what currency? But there are alternate investments as well. A lot, a lot of that money could come back to Trinidad and work for us in a very productive way. Suppose we bring back some of that money and set, set back up the steel plant, the steel processing plant. Wouldn't that be better than leaving it all, like ice in the sun? Right now, right now, the money in the stock market is like, is like ice in the sun, you know. You're just seeing it melt and you, you're not doing anything. So it will be, it will be reckless of, of, of the, the, the government to just leave it and do nothing because the signals have been there for many, many months, many years that the stock market is very fragile, very fragile. Yeah, but as far as this entire evolution that is taking place, uh, we're talking about trade, we're talking about foreign direct investment, we're talking about development financing. All of these things are significant. And if you're playing on the global market, you have to have some way of, of getting access to these things to develop your country. Uh, is it that if those do not... If people, shall I say, if countries don't jump on board, are they going to be left behind? Well, well, they will be, but don't forget there's a major trend taking place. Of uh, first of first of all, we said globalization over the last thirty years. Right. But there's a reversal of globalization now. There's a massive reversal of globalization. Now, when Trump was there, he said, "Wait a minute, we don't we don't make anything anymore. We are borrowing money from China to buy Chinese goods." And say, how long can we sustain an economy, economic uh, uh, design along those economic models? You can't. So you have to start making things again. I'm asking a question and I'll throw it out to the public. Why can't the HSF invest in productive investments in Trinidad and Tobago where the government or the fund itself can get, uh, could get a positive return? Why can't we do that? There are many plans that we can set up in Trinidad. The plants that you set up in Trinidad, one is recycling, that will save on foreign exchange if we can manufacture things here. And what comes to mind very clearly is that why can't we, at the moment, we are shipping out all our, our, our scrap, scrap metals. We're shipping it out and we're buying finished goods by way of um, what you call rebars and so on. Why can't we set up a plant locally? That means to say, 
we can also export our surpluses. We have the natural gas, set up the plant. I, 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 I've done some numbers on it. It, it just, it's just going to take about 11, 12 million US dollars. We're going to lose all that money in the stock market, you know. Nike, believe me, we're going to lose all that. The bank run has, not start, has now started. People saying, people saying, the, 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 the three banks in, in uh, Plus Republic, so there are about four banks, and there are about 12 banks, in addition to what we know about, um, that has been delisted from the stock market. So it's a major run that they, the, the media is not covering. There's a major, major run on the market. Now, they're all trying to blame, as if they're all knowledgeable, all these economists and all these, uh, 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 what you call, um, capital markets, financial experts. What they are saying is that the problems in the banks today is that because the government and the Federal Reserve have increased interest rates, that is just part of the problem. They are not talking about the bad debt on the book by way of consumer loans, by way of housing loans, that's mortgages, by way of uh, the, the student loans. So there are many assets on the books that are rotten and they are not talking about it. Yeah, but, but again, if, if you know that your money is tied up on these markets that are very volatile at this time, and you mentioned banking, the fact of the matter is that banking giant UBS is buying trouble rival Credit Suisse for almost US $3.25 billion. And this is a deal orchestrated by regulators in an effort to avoid further market shaking turmoil in the global banking system. I mean, they're, they're buying Credit Suisse. So, uh, again, our money is tied up there some way, somehow. Why are we just like sitting ducks waiting for this to happen? As far as well, go on. That is true. So, so, you need to find out did they have any shares in, in Credit Suisse? And that is where the. the, the the central bank as well as government must disclose the composition of our, our investments in parliament. You are entitled to know, I'm entitled, entitled to know, every citizen must be interested in the composition of our investment. Not only the Heritage and Civilization Fund, we have other funds, massive funds. For example, the Green Fund, where is that interested? Do we know that's a few billion dollars? Yeah. The, the, uh, the, what you call it, the, the bank, uh, the insurance, where they, they have about $3 billion TT dollars, where are those funds invested? We need to know. Unit trust, where are those funds invested? Look, I've, I've, we've passed through the uh, 1990s, but coming, coming to 2008, one of the big problems with the banks abroad, that's, that's the OECS countries. They had a massive amount of investment in the United States, and they also all lost their shirts. Out of the 14 indigenous banks, about eight or seven of them went bankrupt. They had to be built. So, then then, then what, what can we expect? Is government going to come and tell us one day, listen, um, we have to tighten here, we have to try to get loans there, and, and never touch basically on the genesis of the problem or the reality to say, listen, we've lost that money. Because talking about Credit Suisse, you are talking about it's among the 30 financial institutions known as globally systematically important banks, and the authorities are worried about the fallout if it were to fail. I mean, that would be a serious domino no, effect. No, but, but anybody in the know will realize this was there in the years in the making. I've been talking about this for, for years now, Mikey, that where is our heritage and civilization fund? I don't know if you recall, sir, about, uh, about a year or two ago, overnight we lost 700 million US dollars. 700 million US dollars, that's almost 5 billion TT dollars, we lost it. Fortunately, the, the market bounced back and we, we recovered 500 million, but we still lost 200 million, 200 by, that's about 1.3 billion dollars. Yeah. All because of slackness, all because of slackness. We should not be in the stock market. We, we have to be very careful in our currency composition yeah. concerning our investments. It's scary. And somebody has to tell us what is the policy with regards to managing all of our funds. And we have several funds. HSF is just one. Yeah, it's scary. The banking sector, Mikey, the banking sector has 
long, in a long, they are long position. They have over four billion dollars outside of Trinidad. Outside, why are they having it outside? FCB with their recklessness, they went and invested in the stock market in Jamaica, in Barista. Barista probably has investments in the United States. Mm. Very this scary. thing is very serious. Very this scary. is, this this is, is not 2008, you know. No, it's not. This is 2008 on steroids. Okay. Believe me. Mr. Zero, I want to thank you so much. Our time is up, but we will continue this conversation, part two. I know many people who are in the dark are starting to understand what is happening here, and we have to enlighten them because we can wake up one morning, as, as I mentioned before, and you agreed that we could hear that all of it is gone because we simply were not prepared. Closing comments quickly. Well, well thank you very much for inviting me to highlight on perhaps, perhaps the most important um, the, the uh, issue facing Trinidad and Tobago now is, is what we discussed today. Not, not, not the ceremonial treatment uh, of, of the president. That is, that is a non-issue. Not the backbiting and, and, uh, between the opposition and, and the government. Those are non-issues. Those are theater being played every day, every day, every day. They are not contributing to the development of Trinidad and Tobago. Why is fires burning on, on our seat? These people are engaging in theater. And that is what is worrying about, about Trinidad and Tobago. Nobody is handling the major issue that we are facing. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We yep. will talk again soon. Yes, thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you so much. Very